Thanks, Ron. Morning, everyone. If you have your Bibles, please keep them open at that text that was read. Thank you. Let's just bow in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to gather freely in your name, lift up, lifting up our voices in praise and adoration for you are worthy of all praise. Father, as we come to your word now, we're very conscious we are dealing with matters of eternity. And I do pray that by your spirit you would give all present here this morning ears to hear, whether they be believer or not, to hear your word, to understand it, and to believe it. I pray this for your name's sake. Amen. When we speak today of um, superpowers, invariably we think of political powers. But our text this morning, Romans 5, 12 to 21, speaks about two superpowers, but they're not political. They are spiritual. These powers operate across every culture and every generation. In fact, every person who's ever been born belongs to one or two of these superpowers. The superpowers I'm speaking of are the powers of sin and grace. I think we saw sin, the power of sin, portrayed in that video clip this morning. According to our text, sin is a power that flows from one man and leads to death. But grace is also a power that flows from one man and leads to life. The two men I'm speaking to, referring to, are the first Adam, the Garden of Eden, and the so-called second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. Adam and Christ here are portrayed not merely as two historical figures, but also as two representative figures. The first Adam is the head of a race of sinners. The second Adam, Christ, is the head of a new race of redeemed people. Now as we look at our text this morning, we can see in those first two verses, verses 12 to 14, Paul's overall point there is very clear. Adam, through his disobedience to God's command in the Garden of Eden, introduced death, both physical and spiritual, to all mankind. Paul reinforces this point in the verses that follow. Verse 15, we are told that many died by the trespass of the one man referring to Adam. And again, verse 17, death reigned. There we see the power of death through that one man, referring to Adam. Now, if you can cast your minds back to a year ago, we were still dealing with the, if I can call it, the remnants of the COVID pandemic. As you're probably aware, the spread of COVID-19 can be traced back to a single source, and according to our text, so too sin and death. But unlike COVID-19, the infection rate is 100%. And where is COVID-19? Only, only the, about 5% of those infected by the virus died. According to the Apostle Paul, the fatality rate from sin is 100%. As one commentator puts it, we are all on a roller coaster ride that ends in death. Not a very pretty picture, but you can't argue the point. We know this to be true from our experience. Today we continue to experience the consequences of Adam's sin. One writer puts it this way mankind has lost paradise. We've lost paradise. We've lost the paradise of Eden and all its delights and privileges. Fellowship with God, intimacy with God. We have become subject to pain, weakness, 
suffering, and then we all die. However, fortunately this morning, Adam doesn't have the last word in this life. Paul in our text draws attention to certain similarities between Adam and Christ. Remember, Paul was an Old Testament scholar. And in the process, he describes Adam as a type or kind of Jesus Christ. Because just as Adam's actions impact humanity, so too do the actions of Jesus Christ. Of course, we understand this concept of our actions impacting others. Think back again to the pandemic when we followed hygiene protocols designed to minimize the spread of the disease to others. But in Romans 5, 15 to 17, Paul is very quick to contrast Adam and Christ, to contrast the impact of the first Adam and the second Adam, because as one writer said, the similarities between the two of them are very superficial. In these verses, Paul says this, but the gift, the gift referring to the gift of God through Christ is not like the trespass referring to Adam. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The impact of the one is negative, the impact of the other is positive. Look with me at verse 16. Paul there says, The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. One sin, negative consequences. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Again, looking at verse 17, where Adam's sin brings the reign of death. There's that superpower again. The reign of death. Christ, we are told, brings the reign of life. Life rules through Christ. And it's a reign that believers will share as they rule with Christ over creation, fulfilling the so-called creation mandate in Genesis 1, 28. That's the destiny that Christ brings to believers. Significantly, in these verses 15 to 17, the constant refrain is, how much more? How much more? How much more? How much more God's gift in Christ overcomes the impact of Adam's sin? In these verses, Paul refers to God's, and I quote, abundant provision of grace. It's a beautiful picture. It's a grace that cannot be exhausted. You know, you, you, can you imagine coming to God one day and asking for forgiveness? He says, sorry, <laughs> um, my grace is exhausted. It's, it's, it's come to an end. It's limited. Um, it's a grace, we are told, that overflows to the many. Picture of wonderful abundance. Sufficient to cover, we are told, many trespasses. Many trespasses. My friends, Satan would have you believe that God is a miser, wants to spoil your fun. I mean, look at the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Remember Satan's lie in the Garden of Eden? God says you can't eat of any of the fruit of the trees. God doesn't want you to have any. It was a lie. Unfortunately, some today believe that lie. One commentator summarizes the teaching of these verses as follows, and I quote, Adam's sin, though infectious, deadly, pervasive, and total, 
cannot override the sheer immensity of the saving power contained in God's gift of justification and life. God's response to Adam's transgression is not just to cancel it, but to exceed it by grace that abounds and overflows and erupts towards all humanity. Sin has been obliterated by grace. Isn't that a wonderful quote? Sin has been obliterated by grace. Yes, my friend, sin is a superpower. And whether we believe that we sinners or not, when we die, that's proof. <laughs> Positive. That we are sinners. But Paul's point here is that grace is also a superpower. And more than capable of overcoming sin and death. Paul describes Christ's impact repeatedly as a grace gift. A grace gift. I think the ESV talks about a free gift. The gift of God. You receive something you don't deserve. The wages of sin is death. We get what we deserve. But the gift of God gives, God gives us something we do not deserve. Consequently, this gift is based exclusively on Christ's obedience, not ours. Look with me at verses 18 and 19 of our text. And you're going to notice here that there is a, a very striking symmetry in these verses. You know, when you, look, when you look at these verses, you will see this concept of one man, one man, one man, one man, one man, one man, coming up again and again and again. It's all about the contrast between the impact of the first Adam and the second Adam. Verse 18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. That's Adam. One trespass, condemnation, all people. So also, one righteous act. Now, there's debate as to whether that refers just to the cross. Remember Jesus said, Lord, not my will, thy will be done. Take this cup from me. Or whether it refers to the entirety of his life. As we saw on that video, he was without sin. So also one righteous act, in contrast to the disobedience, the trespass, resulted in not condemnation, but justification and life. More than justification and life. God declares us to be right with him. And therefore we receive the gift of life. And again, for all people. For all people. You can see the, the symmetry. What the first Adam does, this does, has done, the second Adam overcomes. For just as through the disobedience, again referring to Adam, of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. All that the first Adam has done, Christ has come to undo. Our text concludes by affirming that sin is defeated by grace. Not law. See, many people today, you know, they, you know, if they battle with sin, they say, well, I need to do better. I need to try harder. Paul says, no. You, you, you don't have the power. You don't have the ability. My friends, think of this for a moment. If we had the ability 
we had the ability to, to overcome sin, why would God send His only Son to die? Why? When the law was given, instead of bringing life, it brought death. Paul talks about this later in Romans chapter 6 and 7. The problem wasn't the law, the problem was us. The problem was the flesh. So Paul concludes by affirming that sin is defeated not by, by grace, not by law. Salvation is through the Messiah, not through Moses. If Moses could have saved us, we would not need a Messiah. According to Romans 5, 20 and 21, the Mosaic law did not count as sin, but as one writer said, only increased the count of sin. So when the law comes, we suddenly become aware of the sin problem more acutely. Now we become aware that we don't love God. That we covet. We disobey. We lust. We steal. We murder. I mean, think of that first sin. But, says one writer, even where sin increased because of the law, grace increased doubly. Again, think of that wonderful picture of the overflowing grace of God. How much more? Paul here, of course, writes from his own experience. Remember Paul the great persecutor of the church, or Saul as he then was. Let me quote from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 to 17. Here Paul writes to Timothy and he, he reflects back on his, his uh, transition from persecutor to, and Pharisee to an apostle. Even though Paul says, I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man. Paul was a violent man. You know, when Paul gets converted, the people don't believe it. I don't think any. I don't think. I don't think Saul was on anyone's prayer list in that context. <laughs> Lord save them. People feared him. Paul was so, so opposed to the person of Jesus Christ that he traveled all the way to Damascus to have believers put to death. Thrown in prison. Remember that first martyr Stephen. There was Saul standing there and people put their garments at his feet as he was stoned to death, Paul approving. But he encountered Christ. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. I think what Paul is saying here is this. What I did did to the church of Christ was so horrendous, so evil, that had I done it knowingly, surely God would not have forgiven me. But I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But listen to this. The grace, you see, here's the superpower. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Isn't that wonderful? It's the language of Romans chapter 5. Along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. So this is kind of Paul. I mean, Jesus says, truly I say unto you, this is Paul's version. 
Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. See, my friends, uh, sin is no match for God's grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. When the law comes and sin begins to multiply, the grace of God is more than sufficient to secure our forgiveness. Like Paul, this should lead you to doxological praise. Why does Paul end on a note of praise? Because he knows this is, this is grace, this is mercy. Mercy, God doesn't treat us according to what our deeds deserve. Grace, God gives us what we don't deserve. Well, let me make some concluding reflections here. When I say that, the people always sort of wake up. <laughs> Did someone say concluding? <laughs> I think what we learn from this text this morning is that death, death is a formidable foe. Paul describes death as reigning, as reigning. It calls the shots. It is a consequence of the superpower of sin that we cannot defeat in our own strength. We know death is inevitable. Many may question whether there is life after death. But no one disputes that there is death after life. However, death need not have the last word in our lives, thanks to God's grace. Enter the Lord Jesus Christ. One man does what mankind cannot do, defeats sin and death. One writer puts it this way, It is by one man's disobedience that paradise is lost. It is by another man's obedience that paradise is regained. As Ralph said this morning, I teach at the Bible Institute. And uh, when applicants, uh, when someone wants to come and study at the college, they have to fill in an application form. And part of the process is they need to fill in referees forms. Referees who will testify, first of all, that they're Christians, that they're uh, in good standing with the local church, and that their desire to study has the blessing uh, of their pastor. And so in some ways you can think here that the, the way Christ is portrayed here, Christ in a sense is, becomes your referee before God. But here he, what he does, he doesn't plead your merits, he pleads his merits before God. His righteousness, his obedience, even death to, unto death on a cross. And therefore, says Paul, because of that, the outcome is assured. Acceptance is assured. Your application, so to speak, is approved. It's important to note that our text begins with the word therefore in chapter 5, verse 12, providing a link with the preceding verses in Romans chapter 5. One commentator writes as follows. Once we understand that Paul is making a positive point about the overwhelming power of Christ's word, work, we can fit this passage, our passage this morning, into its context. In Romans 5, 1 to 11, Paul assures believers that they will surely be saved from God's wrath on judgment day. Now in these verses, our text, Paul explains why believers can be so certain of this final salvation. Christ has more than overcome all the negative effects of Adam's sin. That's his point. How can I be so certain? Because what Christ has done more than overcomes Adam's sin. 
those who are in Christ no longer need to fear the condemnation that Adam's sin has brought into the world. Yes, we will die, my friends, because we live the Christian life in fallen bodies, but we will not face condemnation. We will reign in life. They are destined for this through the power of grace for eternal life. So according to Paul, there are two ways to live. In Adam or in Christ. We are born in this realm of Adam where sin, death, and condemnation rule. That's our, that's our birthright. That sweet little gurgling baby lying in the nursery born in sin facing death. Realm of Adam. It's your natural condition. If you remain there, death and condemnation will have the final say in your life. But there's another realm, the realm of Christ, where grace, righteousness, and life rule forever. As Paul says elsewhere, in Christ, death has lost its sting. We no longer need to fear death. And so the all-important question is, how do we move from the realm of Adam to the realm of Christ? It's an important question, wouldn't you say? Given the inevitability of death. That's why I said in my prayer, my friends, these are matters of eternity. Some have seen universalism in these verses. In other words, all will be saved. Quoting verse 18, all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Irrespective. But Paul, if you look at verse 17, Paul is clear that the benefits of Christ do not flow automatically. The grace gift is only for those who, and I quote, receive it by faith. If I could use a simple illustration. If you think of the parking lot outside as the realm of Adam, all mankind. And in this school hall, this is the realm of Christ. And Christ, if you like, is the doorkeeper. And my friends, in order to enjoy salvation and the gift of life and righteousness, we need to move by faith from that parking lot into the realm of Christ. And so, of course, the all-important question is this. Have you taken that all-important step? Coming to church on a Sunday morning in the middle of winter when the pastor's not here? Good for you! <laughs> Coming back to hear me preach again, well, bonus points. It's a good thing, but my friends, it does not make you a Christian. And so maybe my analogy breaks down, doesn't it? But you get the point. We need to embrace the gospel and put our trust in Christ. No Christ, no life. No Christ, K-N-O-W. No life, (laughs) K-N-O-W. You don't need a PhD. (laughs) Very simple. So for the unbeliever this morning, the message is don't delay. Put your trust in Christ. Don't be deceived, my friends. Death will not bring deliverance for you, but judgment The good news this morning is this. It's not too late to put your trust in Him until it's too late. Recently there was this story, perhaps you caught in 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 the press about the submarine. A couple of billionaires on the submarine. I think late 50s. Looking forward to an Interesting little excursion to see the Titanic. And suddenly, gone. Unexpected. 
who would have said? Death waits for no one, my friends. I think of that Matthew Henry quote, there were two thieves on the cross. One was saved so that no one should despair. You see, it's never too late, but only one that none should presume. Oh, when I'm older, I first want to enjoy my life. When I'm older, then I'll get right with God. Oh, my friends, you're no match for death. You never know when it will come calling. And I hardly need to point out that no other hope of eternal life is offered in this text. No other name given to us under heaven whereby we might be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. If salvation was possible in any other way, would God have sent his only son to die? Surely not. For the believer this morning, don't despair. When you stumble and fall into sin, as you will, that's why we have a time of confession. <laughs> because we do stumble and fall. Your sin cannot undo the work of Christ on your behalf. That's the message. Salvation is God's grace gift to you in Christ Jesus. And therein lies your confident hope of eternal life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time in the Word this morning. Again, I'm sure I've said nothing that this congregation have not heard before, but perhaps there be some in our midst that have not moved from that realm of Adam to the realm of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you've given them another opportunity this morning to take that step of faith. And for those of us that find ourselves in you, Lord, help us to rejoice again in the sure knowledge with gratitude, gratitude for what Christ has done for us. Christ has done for us what we could not do for ourselves, and we give you praise and glory. Help us, we pray, by your Spirit to live lives that reflect the gospel. We pray this for your name's sake. Amen.